Joshua, 10th chapter, 12th verse. On the day the Lord gave the Amulites over to Israel, Joshua said to the Lord in the presence of Israel, Son, stand still over Gibeon, and you, moon, over the valley of Alcon. So the sun stood still and the moon stopped till the nation avenged itself of its enemies, as it is written in the book of Asher. The sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down about a full day. There was never and has never been a day like it before or since. A day when the Lord listened to our human being. Surely the Lord was fighting for Israel. The subject of my message, Lord, hold thy son till thy victory is won. Various scientific and literary expressions have been proposed as a reason this event happened, such as the slowing or stomping of the earth in its axles. Some say the prolonging of daylight by a special refraction of sun rays or the promulgating of darkness by a solar eclipse or by a hailstone so the battle might be fought in the shade. But the best example and explanation is simply that it was a miracle by God. Amen. And there is no explanation. God does things His way. Amen. And in so doing, we can't always explain why He did it. And especially not how He did it. And it is as a result of that that quite often when we are caught up in reading the many miracles for which has taken place, the explanations for which we hear many give, is just their interpretation yes, yes. of God's love for mankind. Yes. There have been many promises made by God, and in the situation for which Joshua was confronted with. It was a promise for which God made to Abram. Not Abraham at that time, it was Abram he had made. When we go to Genesis 15 chapter, 12th verse, and I will read it from the 12th through the 21st. And the reason that I'm reading it is because I really want you to understand when God made promises, it may take a little time for its fulfillment because we haven't lived up to our deserving such. But the key is, when he does make those promises, he fulfills them. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, a horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in the land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterwards shall they come out with great substance. And I shall go to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation, they shall come hither again, for the iniquities of the Amorites is not yet full. And it shall pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between these pieces. And the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, 
unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates, and the Kenites, and the Kaznites, and the Kamenites, and the Hattites, and the Pizzarites, and the Rephraim, and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Gokkalites, and the Jebusites. That was the promise that God gave Abraham. And it was through that promise that today, as we speak upon this subject, Joshua is fulfilling it. We all know that the children of Israel was in the wilderness for 40 years upon their release from bondage after 400 years. But God had given Abram a promise. And after their tour of duty, you might say, for 40, 40 years, it was time now for God to deliver that promise. And he chose not Moses, but he chose this Moses' assistant to take over where Moses had left off. Amen. And that assistant was Joshua. Yes. And it is as a result of that now, we're speaking of Joshua going forth in the fulfillment of the purpose for which God gave Abraham. Around four plus centuries ago, it was a situation for which, as Joshua took responsibility, one of the first chores was that he had to get over into the land of the Canaanites. And there was a river that separated the land for which he had been promised from the wilderness for which they had been in for 40 years. And that was the River Jordan. The promise was made, so as a result of the promise, as he did the Red Sea, he parted the river of Jordan, whereas the children of Israel could walk through the 20 miles, the 20 miles that was necessary for them to get to the promised land. Thereafter, we've heard the story of Jericho. We know that uh, there were spies that were sent out to campus the city and we know what happened as a result of what God did for the children of Israel in overcoming Jericho but not just Jericho although there were arrows made after the capture of Jericho there was I that was there some arrows were made but the key is that after it was corrected the children of Israel followed forth and captured the city of Ai now the next in line was what would he do in regards to the Amorites. It so happened that between the Amorites and where the children of Israel was located, which was in Gilgad, there was a group called the Gibeons. And the Gibeonites, they had heard about the wondrous work for which God had done on behalf of Israel. So they recognized that the magnitude of their city was such, and the power of God was greater, that it would behoove them to make peace with the children of Israel. But they being looked upon as enemies and neighbors of where at that particular time Israel was located, how could they become neighbors, friends, when they would be looked upon amongst the Israelis as enemies? Mm -hmm. So a group of them decided that they would masquerade themselves. Yeah. And they put on some clothes that would indicate that they were from a faraway land and they had been traveling a great distance. And they went up to the children of Israel, the princes there, and made a plea, informed them that they were from a far land, and they did not know anything about the area for which they were in, and they needed a peace.
peace treaty with the children of Israel, whereas they may continue on in their pilgrimage. It was a lie. Yeah. The children of Israel were gullible. They accepted what was presented to them, as so many of us Christians do when we hear someone that's in trouble, that have a plea, we do the same thing. So they did such without, without checking with the master. The master with whom had opened the river of Jordan for them, the master that had given them the city of Jericho and I, they just thought that this was the right thing to do. So they did. So there was a peace treaty in the city of Gibeon, which was a major through fair and port in the children of Israel pursuing the land of Canaan. And this is where we are now. I wanted to kind of bring you up the first nine chapters of Joshua, whereas you can get to where we are at this Amen. time. The question that we have today, this morning, is how much trust do you have in the God you serve? Whose faith are you operating with? Is it God or is it man? Our question I ask, is there anyone by way of your God, is there anyone by way of your master who can hold the sun all day long at your request? That's the God we serve. And it is as a result of that that by way of the request that Joshua made, we can talk about such in this particular sermon. And it is as a result of this episode from the life of Joshua and Israel fighting the Amorites, it should make us realize that it's with the right faith, it's with the right belief, it's with the right trust. But more than anything else, it's with the right relationship Amen. that we can develop. Amen. That we part with God Almighty. Amen. Faith can be relied upon for protection, for help, deliverance. And we should expect more with the Spirit of God. And I say that because his spirit, as a result of what Jesus Christ did for us in having the opportunity of everlasting life, that spirit is operating inside of us right now. And it is through that spirit for which those requests for which we may ask is incumbent upon the Lord to hear our request and to be obedient toward it. If, as Joshua, we have developed a relationship with God. So, what I come to you today to talk about is how do we get that type of relationship whereas God Almighty can hear our request as we promptly normally make each day through prayer. Amen. But how do we get that answer to our satisfaction? <clears throat> well, the only thing that we can do is look at those characters within the Bible and understand how they were able to do such. And it is by way of the implementation of what they did, we know that God will hear our prayer. Amen. It is because we really don't believe the scriptures, could it be? Is that what it is? Because every day we're picking up this Bible, we're reading it. And yet we know that in the Bible it says that God did 
miraculous things. Amen. And yet if it's here, then why is it that we can't get that type of response from him? And especially now, especially when Paul in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, yes. he said to Timothy, all scripture is written by the inspiration of God. This, this that I raise up to you, it's done by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be protected thoroughly, furnished into all good works. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? What I'm saying is that if Joshua can ask the Lord, hold thy son until thy victory is done. If he can do that, why can't we? And our petition to God Almighty get the same response. It's something that we've got to indulge in our spirit. And especially when we know that God's spirit is operating inside of us by way of the gift that Jesus sent down to dwell in us. Amen. So, <clears throat> yes, God's purpose in the miracle was to show us today what he can do for us with faith. His promises are not slackened or do away with, but to quicken and encourage our endeavors as he will not fall, he will not fail those who trust him. We may be wanting and trust. We may be wavering in our belief, but his word never can want for our success as long as we trust him as long as we put our trust in him. And not man, but him. In John 14, 12, 14, Jesus made a promise to us. He said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works shall he do. Because I go into my Father, and whatsoever ye ask in my name, that will I do, that my Father may be glorified in the Son. Ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. I will do it. You shall ask anything in my name, and I will do it. And it is that for which today, by way of that promise, that it's incumbent upon us to take a different approach in life, a new start, to recognize that whatever was taking place Yesterday can be behind us because we know what God can do. And if he can do it for Joshua, he can do it for us. It's so important to recognize that regardless of what the obstacles may have been for which we were confronted with, regardless of the hardships that we may have encountered, regardless of what problems Sickness, legal, credit-wise, we got all of them. And we're always concerned about how can we overcome those little fractions and interruptions in our life. And yet, we know that if God can do it for Joshua, yes, why can't he do it for us? Yes. Is it because we just 
we've lost the hope, we've lost the trust, we've lost the love of the belief. Is it because the, the world for which has contaminated our spirit in such a way that we've become a little more consumed with that of the world than that of the word? Whatever the reasons are, that can be for us yesterday. Because today can be a new day for us. Amen. It can be a new day because we can take a new direction in our life. We can take a greater determination that we're going to have that relationship with God Almighty. We don't have to wishy-washy around with that of the world versus that of the Word. It's the Word for which will give us the foundation for which Jesus has already promised to us. He said, ask and I will do all for you. But in order for him to fulfill his promise, his teachings, for which he brought forth in this land, it's incumbent upon us yes. to be obedient toward them. Yes, yes. Because it is by way of his teachings for which will give us the leverage, the headway, for which we then can look to God Almighty and ask our Father, our Savior, whose spirit is operating inside of us. Yes, yes. Help thou my Father. That for which I seek thee. That's what this life is about. That's what we are here in church today yes. to see. We were here to hear the word of God, but greater than that, we're here to go forth and execute that word. Yes. Execute it in a manner to the degree that we will have the relationship that we desire because we know that it is available to us. Mind you, I said, it's available to us. How many things in this life that we know that is available to us? With God, all things are available. All things are possible. Simply because there is a supreme being up there with whom Joshua asked him to hold the sun yeah, yeah. and then hold the moon in another city well, well. until my victory is won. Yeah. Lord, that victory is upon us today. Yes. That's the victory for which the pains inside of us in the morning may be lingering on us. Mm -hmm. That's the victory in which the the boss with whom we are confronted with in a consistent manner, there is turbulence that can be resolved. That's the victory for which there is necessary funds that need to be supplied to us and we don't know where it's gonna come from. That's the victory for which we can seek from God Almighty. And through such, we can say, Father, hold thy son until my victory is won. In Joshua, first chapter, five through six, as the children of Israel prepared to cross the river of Jordan and enter into the land of Canaan, God gave jo Joshua a promise. And he said in 10.5, there shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so will I be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Be strong and of good courage, for unto his people shall thy divide for an inheritance the land, which I swear unto their fathers to give them. What God was saying to Joshua was the fulfillment of a promise that he made to Abraham. Amen. And it came to pass when Adonadic, king of Jerusalem, heard how Joshua had taken Al and had utterly destroyed it, as he had done to Jericho and its king, so he had done to Ai and its king, and how the inhabitants of Gibbon had made peace with Israel and were among them. 
that they greatly feared because Gibeon was a great city, like one of the royal cities, and because it was greater than I, and all of the men there were mighty. Therefore, Adonikah the Zach, king of Jerusalem, sent to the other kings in the Jerusalem, saying, Come up to me and help me, that we may attack Gibeon, for it has made peace with Joshua and with the children of Israel. Therefore, the five kings of the Amorites, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jermoth, the king of Lashid, and the king of Eglon, gathered together and went up, they and all their armies, and camped before Gibeon and made war against those that were a part of Gibeon. It seems that there was fear in the land of the Amulites. And that fear grew greater as a result of one of their own became a partner of the children of Israel. And although it was a devious trick for which brought about that type of relationship, the fact of the matter is that the Amorites felt threatened as a result of this peace treaty that the Gibeonites had received. So they decided that they would attack the country of Gibeon. And that's what happens with us so often. When there is trouble in the land, there's a tendency that we feel that the relationship that we once had by way of whatever compassion there, there may be, whatever conflict that there may be, whatever type of sensualness that may be amongst the family members, there's a tendency for us to go against that family member. That's not wrong. That's not God. And yet, what happened to the Gibeonites was the fact that they felt that they were going to be conquered by the children of Israel. And as a result, they felt that it was necessary for, what is it that we all cling to and seek after? Self-preservation. And that's what they did. Now, recognizing the fact that the cities, the, the kings of the Amorites had set up camp outside the city of Gibeon. The Gibeonites felt that they were at war with their neighbors, their friends, and there was no way that they could win. But they had a treaty with the children of Israel with whom they fought by the work of God through that nation, they thought that they had a friend. So what happened? They decided that they would call upon the children of Israel for help. It's so interesting that in these times, we call it the end times, we're reminded of how deception takes place. But also, we know that it's always through obedience to Jesus' teaching that God can glorify us. We always should remember that Jesus' death was not in vain. Amen. It may have been in pain, but it was not in vain. We Christians today are confronted with a similar war. We are at war with those who teach and preach uh, that the life that you should live should be the life of humanism, the life of circularism, the New Ages. They've chosen not to follow Jesus Christ and prefer to live the worldly life of carnality, materialism, covetousness, and greed. We may call them the religious unaffiliate or the internet social networking unbelieving crowd. 
We Christians are a threat to such practice and ideology. Amen. And opposite such deceptive demonic policies, there has to be an answer. Their platform is to bring Satan's influence and lifestyle away from God's children and from God's kingdom. Unfortunately, like the five kingdoms of the Amorites, they are a threat because such influence affects our sons and our daughters, our relatives, our friends, our neighbors, and those of us who desire to be a faithful servant of Jesus Christ. We are the ones that are facing opposition, and it's in times like that that we, as the children, and as the city, and as the nation of the Gibeonites, have to call upon God's people for help. And that's what they do. Recognizing the problem and what they were confronted with, the treaty that they had made with the Israelites, they chose to call upon the children of Israel to help and protect them. If there is any lesson, any moral in this story, what it is is in times of need, there is but one with whom you can call upon. Amen. And that's God Almighty. Amen. That's why we're in the church today. Because we recognize that it's important to develop that rapport with his spirit. It's important to develop that relationship with him. It's important for us to be in tune with the spirit that is operating inside of us and by way of that spirit we can seek out God Almighty. Amen. Just by way of recognizing who he is and from whence and what he can do for us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what the Gibeonites did and it was as a result of that that Joshua came to their rescue. And it was by way of that rescue that the men of Gibeon sent to Joshua at the camp of Galgid, saying, Do not forsake your servants. Come up to us quickly. Save us and help us. For all of the kings of the Ammonites who dwell in the mountains have gathered together against us. The Gibeonites quickly sent word to Joshua. Do not abandon us, but come to our rescue. They ask God's service for help. Commitments are rather interesting. The commitments are only good if they are backed up. God made a commitment to all of us. And it is by way of that commitment that every day, he is backing it up. You know how and why? Because we are in the land of the living. And as long as we're in the land of the living, there is opportunity. And with that opportunity, there is availability of his spirit to develop inside of us whereas a relationship can come forth. And it is incumbent upon us to recognize that by way of that opportunity, we must take advantage of it. That's what the city and the children of Gibeon did. They recognized, but there was one source with whom they could go for to save them. And that's the source that they went to. We today, we have much that we can do simply because there are many out there that are seeking us. We Christians, we members of the church, we God-fearing people. We have the poor, the saving, the homeless. Those who are tired of running and are saying, I need help, please help me. I've tried man, but he and she don't have the goodness, don't have the knowledge, don't have the wisdom, don't have the power to help me, to heal me, to comfort me, to protect me. Oh, if men and women today still understood the value of giving their word 
and standing behind it. What would this life be like? Jesus speaks of this endeavor during his last days. In Matthew 25, 42, we see what's happening. And I say that we see what's happening because there are too many out there that are homeless. There are too many in the hospital that are lonely. There are too many that are in the streets that are hungry. He said, when I was hungry, you gave me nothing to eat. When I was thirsty, you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger. And you did not invite me in naked, and you did not clothe me sick and in prison. And you did not visit me. Why do we call ourselves Christians? Ten church regularly to hear the word. Does it not give us the desire and encouragement to give to the hungry? Comfort the needy, clothe and visit the sick and homeless. Be a friend to all. I can say that in the short experience that I've had in this church, the members of this church fulfill that purpose. But you are just few amongst many. And unfortunately, when we look at what the Christian doctrine is about, it's about receiving God's word, yes. But it's also about executing his word. <coughs> Why do we call ourselves Christians and attend church regularly to hear the word? Does it not give us the desire? Does it not give us the impetus? That's why we keep the doors of the church open. To receive those who want to come back to he who is omnipotent. He who is omnipresent. Yes. He who is omniscient. Yes. All powerful, ever present, and all knowing. The Gibbonites needed a representative of God to give them hope and escape the consequence of the rash reality of what the nation of the Amorites were prepared to do to them. Joshua had made a treaty with the Yemenites, and although they had tricked him, he made a commitment in God's name, and he honored it. What better example is there for us in this life to do for our mankind? Verse 7 says, So Joshua ascended from Gilgad, he and all the people of war with him, and all the mighty men of Baal. God, we must realize, is always, is always going to be with us if we just believe. And the Lord said to Joshua, Do not fear, for I have delivered them into your hands. Not a man of them shall stand before you. In chapter 1 of Joshua, you can turn to it. Verse 5. Before the invasion of the Canaanites began, God gave Joshua a promise. And what this sermon is about is God keeps his promise. But God often works in his way, not by unveiling some new truth previously unknown. He works by reaffirming promises already given which somehow takes on a special significance and meaning when we began to believe it. There is faith, there is trust, and there is belief we can have in Him. So why can't we do, why can't we do, as He says, trust in the Lord. Oh, that's a famous verse. In all thine heart. And lean not to thy own understanding, and all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. Amen. 
Christian friends, you understand what I'm trying to say. Why is this sermon sitting there? As that sun stood still, glowing until the battle was won, so should our Holy Spirit glow. Before our sons and our daughters and sisters and brothers and nieces and nephews and all who surround us, I say to our Christians, let our light shine on them to give them encouragement, inspiration, determination, enlightenment, strength and boldness. It is so important for us to recognize that we, as Christians, are looked upon in a little different way than man in general. There is something unique about us. There is something different that others look upon us. And if we should become more involved in the development of that relationship with God Almighty by igniting His Spirit inside of us to a point whereas that glow will come forth. Our friends, our sons, our daughters, our neighbors, they will all see it. Simply because out of that glow comes the Spirit of God. Amen. And just as Joshua, Lord, hold thy son. Lord, hold thy son until my victory is won. That's where your victory comes. We have problems, yes, in this life. And especially those close to us simply because we love them. Well, we want them to enjoy life in the same way that we do. We don't want our sons and daughters going into the world and fascinated by way of what that new worldly doctrine is about. We don't want them hanging around by way of that for which the new ages are advocating, or humanism, or secularism. But it's incumbent upon our light to be the example for them. And it's a light for which is going to glow. Have you ever heard of the song saying anything? It just glows. It just glows. But it shines and it brings about energy to us. It brings about life to us. That's the light that is operating inside of us right now. And it's so important for us to get on our knees and get down to God Amen. and say, Lord, ignite that spirit inside of me whereas it can be glowing in such a manner that all men will see it. Yeah. 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 That's the spirit for which Joshua had. We know he had it because all he had to do is say, Hold thy son until my victory is won. Yes. That son is our spirit and operating inside of us. Yes. And it's by way of that spirit that we can ask God Almighty, hold thy son yes. until my victory is won. Yes. And it can happen, Christian friends. Yes. It's something for which you don't have to jump up in a hoo and maw and haw about. It's something for which you can walk around today and say, I am a living witness yes. of God Almighty. That's the spirit that we are seeking today. That's the spirit that this sermon is about. That's the spirit for which, as Joshua had, so should we. It's at a point in life where we've got to recognize that with all of the problems, all of the headaches, all of the misery, be it small or big, we've got to get right with God. 
We don't want to continue the lifestyle that we today are living. There's got to be a change. But that change has to come about within us. The message is just to inspire you. But the message that's going forth is penetrating your spirit. And that penetration is what is so necessary today because it brings about a change. Because that's the spirit that ignites your spirit. And igniting your spirit, it brings about a determination on a change in you to change. That's what this message is about today. It's about that we've tried and we've tried. We've tried our way. Let's try our way today. It's time for a change. And it's time for us to recognize that regardless of who we are and how holy we may be, that there is more of God that we can receive. And it is by way of the determination for which we should seek in that relationship for which that spirit that I speak of can take place. The teaching and the preaching in the church is important. Let's inspire our loved ones, those that are watching us, to make peace with God. The German Christian band line. We all know it won't be easy. But could it be worse than Jesus sacrificing his life for our salvation? My ministry is the outreach ministry. Coming from Wall Street, I recognize that those that were established in church felt that they had all of God that they needed. But it's those that do not know God, have not learned of Him. Those that are on Skip Row, those that are homeless, those are the ones that I see. And in doing so, I can testify that there have been difficult times in my ministry. I've been mocked, I've been befooled, debunked, laughed at, made fun at, ridiculed, ill received, scorned. But through it all, through it all, I ask myself, it's nothing as compared to what our Lord and Savior did of his life. Whereas we can live with him in his kingdom forever. It's nothing like what he did for us. And it's in that line that I'm asking all of us to realize that yes, we have the Holy Ghost operating inside of us. Yes, we know God. There is so much more for us to do because we haven't reached that perfected point that the Lord God is seeking for us. There is more growth that needs to come forward. There is more of him that needs to come out of us. And until we get to the point of doing as Joshua did and asking the Lord to hold that song until my victory is won, we're not there yet. And it's in that light that we have to understand that there is so much that we should do. That's what Joshua did when he told the Lord, Oh, my son, the Son, of course, is inside of us. It's the glory of God who wants to do miracles in our life. 
All he's asking for us to know him as Joshua did. Depend on him. Trust him as the children of Israel did. There is so much work we must do before his return. And as with Joshua, he wants us just to ask him and let him do our work through him. Let him do our work through him. He's the crutch. He's the crutch that we must learn to live on. Because if we can lean on that crutch, we have no worry, we have no problems in this life. Simply because we know that if we lean on his crutch, he will do just as he did for Joshua. He will keep that light shining on us. He will bring about the desired results for which we are seeking. He will be the victory in our life. In Joshua 1.8, God says to us, This book of law shall not depend out of my mouth, but thou shalt meditate within day and night thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous. Then thou shalt have good success. It's all in here. This is where it is. It's not out there on the streets. It's not there on social networking. It's in here, and it's in here in order to develop a closer relationship. It's in the church, not the church for show, not the church for Sunday night club meetings, where God can be found, and we can reserve in Him the desires that we see. Is anything too hard for God? The answer is emphatically no. But it's up to the church, Christians, to prove it. Through our faith in God, miracles can transform the trend of Satanism today. He is acknowledged as the prince of the world. He sent the Holy Spirit to operate inside of us. His teachings and the power of the Holy Spirit. We should have overthrown the boundaries of Satan as black people, to be honest with you, right after slavery. We should have. Because it was that time that we were more dependent upon him than ever before. But we let the world interfere with the godliness which we have become dependent upon. Let us not talk the talk, and let us not walk the talk, but let us live the talk. Let us recognize that if Joshua can say to the Lord, hold thy son till thy victory is gone, why can't we ask the Lord to activate his spirit in us. Give us that belief to increase our faith till our battle 